so how far can tech get us? That's, that's a great topic, I think, and I'm just gonna introduce our panelists coming out. We're being joined by Cory Doctorow, who is a technology blogger and award-winning science fiction author. Um, uh, he co-edits <laughs> the popular blog, Boing Boing. I'm a big fan of it, and is a contributor to many magazines, websites, uh, and he's a special consultant to the Electronic Frontier Foundation a technology-focused nonprofit and civil liberties groups. Next is Jessica Transit. She's an associate professor, the Institute for Data Systems and Societies at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, and her research examines the dynamic cost and environmental impacts of energy technologies to inform technology design and policy. Uh, Arthur Huang is a structural engineer, founder and CEO of MiniWiz, and a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Arthur has spent uh, over a decade turning post-consumer waste into innovative products for businesses and consumers through his company. Uh, last, David Gruber. He is a marine biologist and a Nat National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Uh, and um, he has examined um, coral reefs, and he's a photosynthesis expert and an underwater photographer, and a submersive designer. I like that. So um, welcome, all of you. Um, I want to actually start with Corey, because um, I guess ostensibly he's got the biggest imagination huh. here, because he makes stuff up, puts them in books, and people, people get to read about his fantasies. So I'm going to ask for two short fantasies here. One is, we managed to get through this and survive climate change and turn it around. The other is, it goes the other way. Um, could, could you write a science fiction book that could go either way? Could you come up with a fantasy world? Sure, I, I mean, I think that uh, there was a good point raised at my table at lunch, which is that we live in a dynamic world, right? And, and whatever it is we arrive at as a solution to climate change is not so much a solution as a tactic that we'll have to adapt and adapt again because the things that have uh, given rise to our problems now will, will um, not vanish and, th and they'll just evolve into new things that cause new problems. And I think in every complex system, you can kind of cleave the problem into two pieces. You can talk about how it fails and how it works. So I think, for example, Secretary Xi in, in China is pursuing a system that might work well but would fail very badly, which is you have one person who has almost total and unchecked authority with no accountability, and if they have really good ideas, then their ideas play out very well. If it turns out they have a folly, then you're kind of out of luck. And, um, and so, you know, if you were going to write a science fiction story about a future that worked very well, maybe that, you know, if the conflict is going to be in there somewhere, maybe the conflict is about accountability and, and about how it fails. Um, you know, it, it, my uh, other field is computer science. And in computer science, we don't try to plot a course from A to Z when we don't know the terrain because by the time we've figured out the terrain, it will have changed, right? And so instead, we do this thing called hill climbing, which is when we know where we want to go to, and we know where we are now, and we uh, check to see whether there's any step we can take that might take us closer. And we take that step, and then we see if there's another step that gets us closer still. And in that stepwise way, descending when we need to and trying another route if we get to a dead end, we make it from A to Z, and, and that keeps us from this paradox where the casualty of every battle is the plan of attack, where we've wasted all this time figuring out how to get there. And so I wouldn't try and plot a course there, but I might write up a, a, write a kind of fantastic version of it. So, you know, in my la last novel, Walk Away, um, there is a horrible climate disaster. That horrible climate disaster is attended by and caused in part by an economic disaster of inequality, and the people who uh, survive it and the people who are uh, left behind by the economy just walk away. They walk into these blighted brownfield sites. They use drones to survey the ruins around them. They use stolen code from the UN High Commission on Refugees to figure out how to build fully automated luxury communist resorts out of the ruins. They assemble these ruins. They live there in these kind of anarchist collectives. And then when some weirdo comes along and says, that's my blighted landscape and garbage, rather than fighting them, they just walk away because it turns out that like garbage and blighted landscapes are fungible and we have lots of them. And so that's a kind of ambiguous utopia, yeah. but it's a utopia, but, it but it's a utopia in which like, uh, the, the problems of the system are sidestepped rather than confronted head on uh, in a kind of let's get on with this rather than trying to figure it out. We, we might be at a moment like that, uh, perhaps. Um, I, I want to um, 
actually start a little bit here um, by, uh, I guess let's, let's start with you, Jessica. Um, given our withdrawal from the Paris Accord um, and the emphasis by this administration uh, on coal, um, it, it, it looks like it might actually, I guess the question is, can this be sidestepped? And I'm, I'm thinking about you um, because you work on projects that focus on renewables. I mean, is there a way to sidestep the politics of this moment where renewables really can take off despite all this? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely a way and it's, you know, uh, a matter of renewables, using renewables, but also elect pursuing electrification. Um, uh, growth in electric vehicles, other low carbon sources like nuclear and hydro. So, you know, a range of different technologies. But yeah, I mean, certainly not having the US uh, federal government on board and really moving toward the goals that were set, the near term and the long term goals that were set in Paris is definitely, um, you know, not um, an ideal situation. I mean, it, it hurts the US and it, it's not great for the world, but there is another way you know, to certainly the U.S. over the next four to eight years could potentially stay on track to meeting its goals, and that's that involves, you know, uh, more bottom-up action. So a number of mayors and you know state governments have come out and pledged. Um, they've joined the signed the pledge to say we are still in, and they're working hard to bring about changes in in you know in in their. Um, states and cities to help the US as a whole get toward its goals. So there are ways to do this, but it's certainly, um, I think it requires some, some new ways of thinking about how to get, you know, how to take action at, from the bottom up and, and think about how does that add up to a larger whole and how can we not just kind of do a, a range of different things, but also measure that progress learn from each other, and, and there I think we haven't quite solved, we haven't quite solved that challenge yet. Well, I'm, I, I'm curious, like, how much do you think about the economics of all this? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it seemed like every time solar has been about to take off, you know, the price of oil goes down. Um, now, you know, Trump is trying to push yeah. coal. So how much does that affect your work and when you talk to people yeah. and you're talking about renewables? Yeah, I mean the economics and the cost is critical and it's actually part of the engineering. It should be a part of the engineering process. So when you're thinking about designing low carbon technologies and one of the things we work on a lot is, is asking, okay, will this new technology in the lab, will it actually be able to see cost reductions? Why do some technologies costs fall? Can we predict or anticipate which technologies are gonna come down in cost, can you? but cost is, well, I think we can say, we actually can say some things, you know. Um, there are certain features of technologies that improve more quickly. There are ways to estimate, you know, the potential and the limits to cost reduction. There are different kinds of features like, uh, you know, efficiency improvements that can bring about, if those are possible, they can bring about major cost changes over time. In fact, in the case of solar cells, the single largest uh, driver of cost reduction over the last 40 years has been improving uh, conversion efficiency. But that requires, you know, kind of a detailed device level model to tease out. But yeah, I mean, certainly costs, I mean, it's just so, so important, but actually it's important in every area of technology. So right. I always say that technologies compete in the marketplace based on their cost per unit service. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just that in some areas, unlike in energy systems, you can really provide some new cool functionality and new service, and that's really what drives this, you know, this new phone or this new gadget to take off. In the case of energy, we're trying to provide electricity, we're trying to provi provi provide mobility, and you know, we don't see a change in service whether that electricity comes from renewables or it comes from coal. And so there, even more in those cases, you really have to think about driving the cost down. And I think it's the single, it, for a long time in engineering, we haven't really wanted to think about that so much, at least not in the early stages of technology development. I see that changing, and I think it's, it's just so important. Yeah, I think it's gonna be, gonna be key that consumers yeah. find it to be something they can afford um, in a mass level. Um, uh, I wanted to actually bring in David here and talk about the oceans, which is um, your area of expertise. Um, 
you know, and it seems, from what, what I can see, um, there's increasing damage to coral reefs um, around the world. Um, I, I guess my question for you is, is it repairable? Is, is there a way that technology can actually help us um, bring back coral reefs? Is it doable? Is there a way for technology to bring back coral reefs? Yeah, reef? and to help us, yeah, and to help us keep the oceans cleaner. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, um, you know, technology. What would be your ideal, actually, uh, uh, in that realm? You know, the ideal. What see of, happen? Well, technology has kind of been amazing. And if you think of, where, I guess, where do we want to think of even beginning technology? The, the science revolution really starts like 500 years ago, and it, we moved over to fossil fuels around in the, you know, the 1850s, the 1860s. And in this short time, it's just been powerful. You know how powerful. Um, and I was just reading an article, actually, of Ben Silliman, who was helping the process of cracking oil and getting energy from coal. And the idea was is he wanted to stop the forests because they were cutting down all the forests for steam engines. Um, so this was the solution he was in. And they didn't realize that this would get in, into the scenario we're in today. But here we are now. We've gone through over 100 years of digging up dead animals, using it to fuel this room. This room is still fueled on dead ancient animals, you know, and probably if we can look out into the future, if I was to project what will this room look like in 20, 50, it'll be something totally different. It'll be some of the technologies that you're thinking about. From the ocean, there's something called algolium, which I love. It was one of these ideas of algae could be harnessed to make oil, and it could go right from an algae to an oil, and a lot of companies started to get hired on this, and then they actually moved into skincare products because, um, it just was too expensive. Who here in the room would spend $50 a gallon for algolium to drive your car versus, what is it, like, I don't drive a car. So, 250? I don't know, who would spend 50? But There's probably a couple people in here. Not many hands are going up, right? So it's clearly, but, but we don't wake up and want to destroy, you know, and if, if algolium was a dollar, who would buy it then? There, right? Now everyone would switch, so that would make sense. So it's clearly economic. But can we now reverse the, the things that are happening in the ocean? Humans and coral reefs are like, we just, it's like oil and water, actually. They just don't um, interact well. There's, there's so many reasons and why they don't interact well. Corals are slow growing. Um, they grow really close to shore. They love clean water. They are at the absolute top of their threshold for temperature. So as it gets warmer, they will bleach and they'll break apart the symbiosis that they have. They also are suffering from ocean acidification, which is a byproduct of the rising CO2 in the atmosphere. As the CO2 goes higher, it interacts with the seawater, and the waters become more acidic. So they're actually melting um, due to the increased fossil fuels. So in order to fix them, we would have to kind of fix these terrestrial issues. So it's all interconnected. And I think as these technologies that you're discussing come about, um, we'll be better poised to attract that. But technology is amazing. I'm not putting it down. I think that we have ridden on the back of the environment to lead to this expansive growth that we've had in the last 150 years. And the next 150 years will be about rethinking that. How do we continue to use technology to draw us closer to nature, to repair nature? Um, and that's you, gonna be our second You brought up an step. example in the green room. Was it the, the bacteria? Was this or, or Well, symbiosis, so, yeah. yeah. symbiosis and yeah, how, how that worked. Well, symbiosis is the idea of a plus-plus relationship. And in biology, especially in corals and this algae that live inside of it, it's one of the most powerful things I know of. Two animals come together, plus-plus. They're both benefiting collaborative behavior. And if we look at our relationship with the environment right now, is it a plus-plus? What do we think? No, of course not. It's like we're plus-negative. but. Here's the positive spin. All these plus pluses didn't start as plus. You know, we don't just go into this relationship all happy and lovey. Um, these kind of evolved that way. So they might start out as a parasite and then evolve. So my future vision in kind of thinking, this is what's interesting about things like Corey, we're thinking about, we have so many visions we could paint right now. And as we start painting the story, as we start climbing, I even like that hill idea. We're not climbing a mountain. We're going to, what was it? The, what is the hill? Hill climbing. Hill climbing. We're not climbing, it even sounds nicer. We're not climbing mountains. We're climbing hills. Um, which hill do we want to climb? And let's paint that. And maybe we could you know, end up 
in the hill that we want to be on, rather than kind of finding ourselves in this really, really unhappy hill. Local maximum. Yeah. That's what you want to avoid. Now, I mean, in, you know, um, <laughs> Arthur Huang, you, you've come up with a new technology for recycling um, and uh, are kind of aiming towards a world where we recycle everything, right? So yeah. we're really living in a kind of uh, ongoing, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, how how would this work now? I mean, I think you were yesterday. You were saying oh, everything I'm wearing is, you know. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about your technology and what you're doing. Actually, uh, we don't have any technology. Uh, I think the. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we have enough technology out there, and I think today all this environmental problem has nothing to do with technology. I think uh, it has everything to do with our consumption behavior. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sure we all agree with that uh, in some form, in some way. Uh, and the technology, what let's say plastic, that's polluting the ocean, microplastic is going to the ocean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody heard all this, and especially with the Nat Geo issue this, this, this month, right? Okay, so we know the, the, the problem of all this problem. Uh, but the problem is this plastic was invented for space. It's meant for explorations. It's meant for the highest form of engineering to replace uh, you from killing uh, elephant tusk, uh, to take the elephant tusk to, to make your um, buttons, to uh, make your glasses, right? It's actually, it has a very good intention. It's just the way how we use them, okay? So what we are trying to do is we just take what's available to us, like any normal human being should do, is that uh, okay, technology, what's available to us in mechanically in terms of technology of separation? What's available to us in terms of infrared, how to separate the, the trash? What's um, uh, the plasma heater or anything that's already out there, okay? And what are the big data that's out there that we can collect the data from? What are the AI that can capable help us to select these material within this pile of crap, right? And how can we take that and turn that into something valuable? So maybe in 50 years, this room still looks like this room, okay? Because we already spent the carbon, uh, we already got all this carbon out. Let's keep that in the system, continue to fuel our lifestyle in a cleaner, better way. So all that technology is out there. It's just us changing our consumer behavior. And our consumer behavior only has been skewed to this craziness after the war. Uh, can, yeah, please. So I think when we talk about technology, really what we're talking about is abundance, right? We're saying like, we're not saying how do we maintain the world, because obviously the world doesn't care how many animals live on it. We, at one point, the world was entirely covered in animals that, that poop themselves to death, anaerobic bacteria <laughs> that produce the oxygen that we live in, right? So what we're saying, and we're also like not saying how do we maintain the world uh, but kill half the people on it so that the rest of us can live comfortably. Like we're saying, how do we all live on the world, not in a tiny box, not eating 1,200 calories of low food chain food a day and keeping as still as possible so we don't step on the earth. We're saying, how do we have an abundant life that doesn't drown us in our own poison? And abundance is an interesting thing because it's a triangle, right? So on the one hand is what we can make. And as you say, we're getting, we're pretty good at making stuff. Like, you know, the labor material and energy inputs in everything we use has been in free fall for centuries. You know, the amount of cubic volume covered by, say, um, a cathedral built in the 16th century versus a modern glass and steel office building, uh, it, you know, the, the amount of material okay. to yes. it is, is just, it's just an incredible difference. So we make stuff better. How much we want is another corner of the triangle, and that's a project that people try technologically through marketing and so on to change. Mary Kondo wants us all to reduce our footprint to a single smooth river rock that reminds us of our mother, you know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, that th th we have this whole project to reduce what we want or to change what we want. There's a whole marketing industry that tries to make you want more, and then there's other people well, that make you want Well, where, I mean, this is where I'm concerned about, really what I'm concerned about is human nature. So, but this is, that's where the last piece fits in, which is how we distribute it. So right now, every house has got a lawnmower and a drill in it, and they're terrible, right? <laughs> 
because you only use them irregularly, so why would you buy a very good one? So you have this miserable 11th best drill to make holes twice a year, and imagine if we had better distribution technology where the greatest drill in the world anticipated your need, kind of rolled up at the moment of your need, understood how you used it, improved its material design when you were done with it, degraded uh, 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 gracefully back into the material stream because it was designed to be instantiated and de-instantiated on demand, then you could imagine that even if we wanted an awful lot, we could use things that looked a lot like Zipcar to give us all an awful lot, give us things that are better than what we have now. Rather than a drawer full of third best drills, we would have the greatest drill, but only at the moment we need it, and then it would gracefully get out of our way. I, I wanna open that, I mean, it's, it, it's, I, I liked that idea a lot, and um, yet I feel like, well, how are we gonna get there? And this is, was my opening question, which is, you know, looking right now at the government of the United States, um, where it is, it seems these kinds of changes need support from above. It just, it seems like just having people at the grassroots try and do these things is, is not gonna be enough. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm wrong, right. maybe it will be enough, but. Yeah, 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 I mean, certainly, I think that's right in the area of climate change and other areas, that's, that's right. Um, and so, you know, we have to hope that uh, other countries continue to be very engaged. You know, a number of European nations are, continue to push toward meeting climate goals. China is actually working a, a lot to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, and, and kind of coming back, if I could come back to this topic, because I find it pretty interesting. Um, and I'm gonna do kind of the stereotypical engineering thing and say, we also have to look at the numbers. Um, Your data so, is, you know, <laughs> yeah. What, where, where, what does the data say? Yeah, so, you know, so there, I, I would argue that, I'm gonna argue two things. One is that there are certain problems that we've created, challenges that we've created, um, environmental challenges, that uh, we created through using technology, and that has supported a growing population, growing standard of living, and so forth, and we now need technology to help us address them. So if you take climate change, for example, and you say you wanna reach an 80 to 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, where does that come from? Does that come from behavior? Are we gonna do 90% less? Are we gonna take a 90% cut in population? Or are we going to take a achieve a 90% cut in um, the carbon emissions per unit consumption, per unit energy? And now I don't say, I, I don't wanna argue that behavior isn't important. I think it's very important and actually we shouldn't be thinking about behavior and knowledge and institutions and hardware separately. And that's my second point, which is, you know, I found it very useful to take a very broad definition of technology and uh, include in that definition anything that transforms raw materials here on Earth, biological, geological materials, into some more useful form. So that, inclu that includes skills, that includes knowledge, institutions, hardware, software, what have you. And, you know, but then let's be deliberate about the kinds of technologies that we want. Let's try to measure how they'll impact and anticipate how they'll impact the environment. So we're really good at developing technologies that we don't need, like there was a, someone developed an umbrella drone recently that carries your umbrella <laughs> for you. Um, but you know, there are these really big I need that. <laughs> Right, right, I've said that to a few people and they're so like, that's I would find that flying suitcase that just puts itself in the overhead. <laughs> right, you know? but I'm like, come on, do you really need that, you know, is yes, that the yes, most I do, I do, thing? I right. need it. So this is the issue, no. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but, but what about developing technologies that solve these really big challenges like low cost, low carbon energy. And, and you know, that's where I, I think, you know, by, we, we can do more also as engineers to uh, study technology and develop technology in a different way, but also as citizens and policy. D David, do you want to? Well, I just think that, well, one, that I, I agree yeah. with you, but I think like if you're thinking, I had spent some time in the, in the biotech space and I think there's, there's only so far certain companies could go with, with markets that don't really support the product. Or if, again, for the Algolium, if we're not gonna get to a point where we could be competitive with Exxon, the, these technologies are just never have the chance to rise up. And there are some instances where we do need government support. We need, maybe we need a billion dollars to, to, to invest in, to do something. Look what we did when we were for the Manhattan Project. That's a perfect mm -hmm. example. Um, we took some of the best brains that we knew of. We had a concerted effort. We organized. It was structured. We wanted to do something, and they did it quickly. There's there's plenty of things that could be done. I think of 
Um, for, for years, I've been thinking probably the plastic solution at some capacity could be solved for a couple billion dollars if you put the right teams together. And Why, what would the solution to the plastic problem be in your mind? Well, the solution would be, first, you would take the one or two billion dollars, put it together, you would do an assessment of all the technologies that are out there, look at them, put the, some of the smartest people together that are in this field, which ones have potential, which are the 20 to one long shots, and then you would, you would dedicate labs to kind of working towards this, you would keep checking in with them, and you would get the industry involved who would be the buyers of this, you wouldn't want them to be developing things in, in a vacuum, and we don't have anything of that sort, there's nothing of that sort. We don't have a large scale investment to get rid of plastics, even though we know it's choking the ocean. It's, it's degrading and affecting the, the basic phytoplankton, which is providing us oxygen. We don't have the $2 billion as a, as a nation or any nation to really have a concerted government effort to attack this. So that's. that's, that's there the might problem. have to be a hack around. That's, you know, yeah. Corey's vision here of um, people just kind of being like, okay, it's not gonna happen, I'm just gonna, you know, fight. I think the elephant in the room here is that we became aware that this stuff was all a problem 40 years ago, right around the same time that we had a whole slate of reforms that said that firms should only uh, do things that increase their shareholder value, uh, that they're not allowed to consider externalities, that anything they could externalize, they should, that we would have no antitrust enforcement so firms would get much bigger, uh, and so they would have more lobbying clout, uh, all the reforms that made the rich much richer, and you know, Zizek says it's harder to imagine the end of uh, humanity than it is the end of capitalism. But so long as we're like gonna talk about maybe what the future looks like, um, maybe the thing is that we're not gonna create markets per se that, are, that work like our markets do today that force firms to internalize their environmental costs. Maybe it's gonna be extra market activity. Maybe it's not gonna be governments making an investment, say, but say governments breaking up companies and then till they're small enough they can't influence policy outcomes and then assessing giant penalties against ones that pollute so that they figure out how to solve this. Now, you're, I mean, Arthur, you're, you're talking about behavior changing behavior. I mean, I, and I, I actually wonder to what degree you imagine that playing out. Given, given that, I mean, the environmental movement has been around for decades. There's been a push for people to change behavior for a while, and it's been pretty slow. I mean, you know, I, right now I think the big thing is like stopping people from using straws. There's a, a huge movement yeah. right now around straws. Don't suck, yeah. Yeah, um, I, good slogan. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think, but, for example, this year in Nat Geo, the um, the Explorer Festival, we don't see any plastic, at least tr very few compared to last year. Uh, I mean, and compared to two years ago. I mean, this is already better than what I expected or already. Um, okay, let, let, how about this? Like, I will just paint my future of what I think. Um, yeah, let's hear uh, it. First of all, I think all the future recycling system and remanufacturing system is all decentralized. Okay, so recently we just did a show with Nat Geo, with Jackie Chen, and we went to uh, the Tibetan Plateau. Okay, you know, uh, that's where the glacier of Himalayas comes down and created the three rivers, uh, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, and the Megong River, which powers all of East Asia. Okay, and it's polluted by modern plastic waste, actually. So, Jackie Chan led an ex uh, ex expedition with all the kids um, and to clean up all the uh, uh, riverbanks, okay? We brought the machine, solar power, everything is fully uh, enclosed within the machine, air is being filtered, water is being filtered in the whole process. Within 40 minutes, ideally 40 minutes was too cold, so within 40 minutes, then you can take that trash, collect it from the riverbanks and the glaciers, and we can turn that into building tiles for schools. And this is already happening. We built multiple, we built three machines to do that, okay? And one in Europe, we recently just did that in uh, Milan, London, uh, in all the design fair, when all the designer doesn't even know what the hell is going on with making a fully circular product. And they don't even understand how important it is to design a product with just one single material. Okay, because one single material, you can turn a 30 second uh, drinking bottle after you use that and you recycle that, you can turn that into a jacket like what I'm wearing now. Um, we are also doing that for Nike, for example, and then that becomes maybe two years lifespan. Then you recycle that 
after two years, okay, you turn that into furniture. And then we have a company called Pentatonix that's doing that. Okay? And from that, you recycle the furniture, you turn that into architecture. And we're also building many buildings around the world uh, with that. So all of a sudden, the same molecule, it has this long, long life cycle, right? And potentially infinite and without using chemical change. I mean, that, that, is, that is amazing. I, 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 I didn't, you know, I never thought about it quite that way, but it makes enormous sense. But, but all of this happens slowly, so I'm, I wanna, you know, turn dark just a little. I mean, you know, are we at a point where a lot of this is irreversible and we need technology to adapt us to a very different world? Um, and I brought this up when we all talked yesterday, like I've heard people talk about coming up with a way to take carbon out of the atmosphere, shoot it into the center of the earth, or get Elon Musk to shoot it to Mars. Um, are, are there other ways that uh, we may simply need to adapt to a very different world, even as we do these other things, but that we need to be realistic? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly we need to be adapting to climate change as it's happening now, but it, if we continue along this path, it's only gonna continue to get worse. So then the question comes up, uh, how much adaptation is, is really possible? So certainly adaptation is important, but we also still need to be thinking about mitigation or you know, reducing our carbon emissions through a variety of means. Um, and just kind of to, to touch on that point that, that you brought up, Laura, about you know, how, there, you know, that this is kind of a dark story. I do want to highlight that there have been some successes. So, you know, if, you, if we start from a policy picture, so if you look at how, and we take the example of solar energy, you look at how governments around the world have invested in growing markets. So they've done that through a variety of policy uh, instruments, but um, incentivize the growth of markets for solar energy. You see this really interesting thing, which is that you see roughly constant exponential growth over the last 40 years. But the government's efforts, individual efforts, have kind of waxed and waned. So you see all these countries' efforts kind of growing and falling. But interestingly, and this is just like an emergent growth property, growth has happened in this very steady way, which is kind of interesting because it wasn't planned that way. But anyway, so what's the result of that been? Um, well, that has incentivized markets. Uh, we've also have governments, had government support for research, but also private research due to these growing markets. All these companies you know, around the world um, have worked to improve these technologies, and solar energy has actually seen a roughly 10% cost decline per year through technology improvement over the last 40 years. So it now costs 1% uh, for the photovoltaic module of what it cost 40 years ago, which is the fastest rate of improvement among all energy technologies. So, you know, it's not all bleak. And actually because, you know, so if we take the US situation right now politically, it's good in a way that this is happening now and not uh, 10, even 10 years ago because of the efforts over the last 10 years costs have come down so much that now cities and states can mm. continue these advancements over just the next four to eight years, despite here. what's happening, and then you know, still then, hopefully there will be some federal support and a federal policy um, beyond that. But so it's, it's, it's sort of interesting how without coordination around the world, we've kind of picked up for each other and sort of complemented each other's efforts um, where there have been periods of kind of falling off or failing. Mm -hmm. Others have stepped up, you know, without coordination. So it's, it's not all bleak, I would say. There, <laughs> there is reason for optimism. I think just to, there's an interesting idea that we're bringing up here. So there's the technology aspect of this, of can technology save us? And you were bringing up these ideas of that we're, we're, we've gotten a scenario where we've Put, you put taking all this carbon out of the ground, we put it up in the air, and now we're gonna have to shoot it into outer space and come up with these crazy solutions. And can science do that? And the answer is probably, you know. But then the other thing is it's a little bit is the psychology. And that's almost, in my opinion, on equal importance, you know, the human psychology, because the scientists could be toiling away in their labs until they turn blue. But it's a little bit like I was reading that article in the New York Times about the meth addicts that um, they, they get a heart replacement and then they go back and they're doing meth again and they get another and they say, you can't have another heart. You know, it's like, so we can't lean on scientists to just solve all the problems and you're gonna just jump off this cliff without a parachute and we're gonna 
we're going to MacGyver up a parachute on the way down, um, which maybe, I don't know, you know, I'm hoping. <laughs> maybe, yeah. You know, we're going to speak all confidently. No, people, yes, people we can do that, of course. What, uh, people, people have to want the change. But they have to want the change. But then we also, I almost think that all scientists should have to take a whole bunch of psychology courses. <laughs> because, like, I mean, we need to understand ourselves. I like that idea a lot. We need to know who we are as people. We have incisors in our mouth. We are, we come from a lineage of Does meteors. psychology or just read a lot of dust? Yeah. And, or something. I mean, yeah. And we have weird mother problems, you know, and I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that, like, that you're right that there's this moral hazard that if you make it easier to remediate, maybe people will take less care. But all things being equal, I think if, if I were to say to you, through a process that we believe in as firmly as we believe in the process that made us believe in climate change itself, we found a way to remediate it, some geoengineering technique or whatever, that, that I think reasonable people would say, well, if it makes things better, we should do that, so long as you're really certain about the consequences. But that attaining that certainty requires not just psychology, but also social reform. You know, before we had science, we had alchemy. Alchemy is just like science, except you don't tell anyone what you've learned, right? And that's how alchemists discover for themselves in the hardest way possible that they shouldn't drink mercury, because self-deception is a, a hell of a drug. So you were just talking about how, like, sperm whale researchers don't share their data. Not sharing data is actually a giant problem around the sciences, because the sciences have become uh, uh, more a function of industry than a function of states, and industry views it as a trade secret. So, you know, when a firm comes along and says, well, we're going to put a particulate in the atmosphere and it will reduce um, uh, uh, climate change, it'll mitigate climate change, change your albedo or whatever, we view that with skepticism, not because science is incapable of arriving at a good answer, but because we don't trust firms and the regulators who are supposed to be overseeing them to behave honorably because of these wider social problems. So I think that like the real question we need to ask is like in a future in which we are corrupted, will we be able to break free of the corruption enough that these geoengineering solutions can be tried in an orderly way instead of having people who like believe themselves to be Iron Man just randomly or you know randomly shoving stuff into the atmosphere and declaring themselves to be you know science heroes who will know better than the rest of us, you know? Uh, you know, I I mean, I think that comes back to, um, yeah, some sense of a real social change that's got to happen in how we treat each other. And unfortunately, what I see right now is the world getting more tribal, which seems worrisome to me at a moment like this when we actually need people to come together. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you can convince people to recycle and reuse goods, whether they're tribal or not. I don't, you've been going out there and trying to talk to people. Uh, and what kind of reception do you? No, the reception get? generally is everyone agrees. Okay, no one disagrees. Okay, and the problem is how do you change the behavior? How do you change the convenience? The convenience, what kills us, and what sells, right? Um, so at the end, I think there's a one thing that we can do that can get us off that uh, hurdle. Um, that that's you just have to make everything super functional and super sexy. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. and you I just have to trick. Really. You just have to trick people. Yeah. Uh, most of the people, um, you just trick them. Uh, you, I, I guess you really yeah. cannot. You have to make it cool. You need you need really good marketers. Marketing is. Yeah. Good. I mean, I, seriously. I mean, uh, marketing is often underrated, but it can it know, can really change human. And a lot of cool things. You have to actually make it scarce. You you have to make it not let people get it. You have to make people desire to get it. It's kind of like if you make technology so available, Any solar is no longer any cool. Any business person wants so that. They want to feel like they want you to think their product is scarce, and so yeah. you'll you'll pay so for it just quickly. Because I want to take some questions. As the marine biologist on the on the panel, I think that there's like one thing. There's so much to learn from nature that as well. Like I see nature as high technology. I look at a shark. And it is the highest technology I've ever seen. You know, the skin, the derm, everything about it, the, the feeling, electricity. But sharks have never been in a situation where they've got to have an agreement where all the sharks get together and say, we've been eating too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big deal. We're going to listen. You go over here. You just eat this much. You, you know. So this is, this is a weird situation for us. We are in a bizarre, unnatural situation right now. And I think we should just recognize that that no other species in the planet has had to sort of self-regulate. And we, are we have to evolve faster than our brains. And we have this capacity. So we're going to have to go through this hyper-evolution. 
in the next um, in the next bit of time if we're if we want to paint these we're kind happy of endings to Corey's moving, story. Moving, think, moving forward, you, you know, kind of maybe, maybe we're just sloughing off the old and moving to a new a new place, you know, yeah. and and we're sort of all this old stuff that's out in the open now and we're realizing, oh, we have to change pace. I want to open it up to questions um, for the panel and we have a microphone. So let's start with this gentleman back here since you're close to him. So around about 40, 45 years ago, there was a book called The Limits of Growth that came out. Uh, it's, people trash it because the methodology was pretty flawed. It said by 2015 or thereabouts, we'd run out of everything like aluminum and whatnot, which we haven't done. Uh, part of it was because the methodology was flawed, but probably a bigger issue was that we now recycle aluminum very heavily. Uh, recycling sounds to me like you know, it's got a good history. You can, you can show that recycling has worked for us in, in many different ways. Uh, you've obviously had some good success on sort of medium or small scale recycling. How much do you think you can scale that up? Uh, right now, we are scaling that through machines and uh, data, okay? Uh, we have a material database with about 1,200 new material coming out from only trash, okay? All the stuff we collect through this machine. And what we want is potentially these machines can be scaled through different communities. So then you no longer need this huge infrastructure to be able to take all these machines because data links all these little machines together so you know what type of material is being collected here. And then they can trade. So I would say this is a, uh, if cryptocurrency can be scaled, let's say, then crypto trash currency definitely can scale. So. But, so, yeah, sorry. I think when the Club of Rome wrote, um, uh, published Limits to Growth, they, they made a couple of assumptions that were wrong. One was about recycling, but the other one was about material input, right? They, they assumed that the uh, rate, that the amount of steel in a car would hold roughly steady or, dec or decrease linearly, and it, dec it decreased logarithmically, right? We have a lot less embodied material in manufactured objects, and that's because the less material you use in a manufactured good, the more profit you retain to the firm. Right, and so firms uh, just on their own just did this. There's a great study where these two Bank of Canada economists collected IKEA catalogs and their spouses made them do something with them. So they mined them to find out what the correlates were of a skew remaining in the IKEA catalog over the long term. And what they found is that IKEA furniture monotonically decreases in weight in nations of manufacture, which is basically logistics, cubic volume occupied in shipping, and number of parts. So the material labor and energy inputs just in free fall, two Billy bookcases a decade apart, look identical and are as different as different could be. And so imagine you know, if there were incorporated into uh, uh, whatever system we use to regulate manufacture, whether that's markets or regulation or some, uh, some intersection, a requirement that not only must you reduce material input, but the materials must gracefully degrade back into the material stream. So you don't, you were saying backstage that like you recycle lots of things, but extracting conflict min minerals, which we really want to recycle, requires acid baths and energy intensivity. What if our conflict minerals were surface mounted? What if our devices were designed for repair and not, and, and we didn't have firms fighting right to repair bills that were introduced in 18 legislatures last year and defeated in all 18? by giant companies because repair is obviously better than recycling and recycling materials designed to be recycled is obviously better than designing materials that aren't. You know, the, the limits to growth was not just about misunderstanding recycling. It was about, it was about these other wider factors. Hmm. Capitalism gave an incentive here. That's really, really, really interesting. More, more, uh, more questions uh, generally. Uh, let's see, how about right here up towards the front? It's really hard to choose the questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for your great comments. You know, today is International Yoga Day being celebrated, and the key to yoga is dhyana, not just the asanas or postures, but dhyana, which is zen, awareness, consciousness, uh, concentration. So back to what you said about hyper-upgrading technologies. What are some technologies to hyper-upgrade consciousness uh, and related, <laughs> how do you um, hyper, okay. well, subtractive that's, technology? That's a great Ariana Huffington is That's a great question, have. how to yeah. hyper upgrade consciousness. And the way that I'm thinking about that is um, I'm thinking about how to use technology to connect us. 
And I think that if you could make a really strong argument that all this amazing technology that we have has not drawn us closer to nature. It's made us further apart. We just, I mean, I, you walk around New York City and everyone's like bumping into each other on their phones. You know, we're, we're so deep in our technology. So the question will be, can we, can we use it to, to draw us closer? And the way that I've been thinking, so I've been studying animals and animal eyes and vision and trying to make animal eye cameras because the idea if I can see the world through their perspective, we could use hyperspectral cameras and we could take all these brains to understand a shark or to understand a turtle that at the end of the day, we feel more connected and we've used technology to draw us closer to them. We're thinking about even redoing how we study biodiversity. Is there a way for biologists in the deep sea to study a deep sea creature by just enclosing it and imaging it and like rubbing a little toothbrush on it to get its DNA and then letting it go so we could do inventorying without hurting things. And that kind of invades consciousness in perspective of being gentle. And this tech, we're, we're being gentle and we're also applying this amazing technology in ways where we, we, we're respecting life. And I think that's, that's one way to use it. And, I don't know if I'm really directly hitting your, your question, but I think there, there are possibilities of, of using technology to, to, make us, um, you know, to make us more aware and cognizant people. I, th I think, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just add, I mean, I think this is actually a great idea to think about how to um, bring more consciousness into the process of developing technologies. So how does it happen currently? Well. You know, someone has an idea for some new gadget, some new widget that will do something new, and they, you know, do all the the market research and put it out there. But but you know, what what are the implications for society? So if we pursue more automation, what will that do to jobs? If we, you know, um, make build bigger cars, what is that going to do to the environment? And and these are kind of afterthoughts. Um, I think we need to be much more conscious in the development of the technologies. We have all this data, we have all this understanding, the whole you know, history of our modern economy and its development since the onset of industrialization. Let's really understand the process of technological development, think about what kinds of technologies we need um, you know, in order to, to build a better world. Um, so I like this idea of bringing in more consciousness and what, what I find is somebody who's, you know, based in the Bay Area and covers Silicon Valley is there's these two contradicting mm -hmm. things that go on there. One is, I think the, you know, the environmental movement came out of California. There's a really strong sense of that in the Bay Area in Northern California. And, you know, companies like Apple, I think Apple says it's 100% renewable. You see that baked in. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, you see people, in, you know, inventing these totally ridiculous things that it's right. just all about money. I mean, it's interesting. There's right. sort of two, but there is some philosophical feeling in the valley that people want to unite right. doing well with doing good. You know, you hear that a lot. So yeah. if we can yeah. keep that, you know, how can we? Yeah, and, and also as consumers, let's demand evidence. So if a company says, yeah. you know, by providing this new mobility service, I'm going to reduce emissions. Well, by how much and how do I know and how are you going to measure it? And, you know, so, so I think bringing, kind of opening up and op developing more transparency so people can, you know, I think getting that conversation right. going is really important. I think that, oh, oh big I'm sorry, I was uh, I think that um, uh, networks have changed the way that we are conscious and that it makes it so much cheaper to find people who think like us and work with them. And after all, that's what it is to be superhuman, to do more than one person can do by enlisting someone else. And the good side of that is that it's allowed us to change how we think about gender. It's allowed us to build networks around climate. On the uh, bad side, it's allowed people with heterodox views to find each other and buy tiki torches and go to Charlottesville. And it helped, um, you know, Cambridge Analytica. I don't think Cambridge Analytica found a way to turn normal people into racists. I think it found a way to turn racists into voters. And that, you know, that's what it means to be able to locate people. You know, so be, be, I guess be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Um, another question we have Maybe uh, from here. a woman? Uh, let's see, looking around here. My God, all these questions. How about this guy right here? Thank you, thanks for your great insights. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working for a retailer, and I was really struck at this idea of cultural change. We were doing a focus group about the future of T-shirt design, and we had lots of teenage girls, and they sort of laughed at us and said, we're not going to be buying T-shirts in a few years' time. We want to 3D print T-shirts at home and recycle them. 
And I was really struck by this idea that a lot of what we have to achieve is gonna come from cultural change, and that will start with education. So my question to you is, are we doing enough to educate future generations about the ways in which they can change their behaviors? I mean, I, you know, I don't know that we have education experts. Well, I think well, I, I, I mean, I'm well, an educator, teachers, yeah. I'm a teacher. You're a you teacher, go first, you yep. go first. No, no, you got, it, you got it, yeah. <laughs> you got it. We're very polite, as you yeah. can see. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah I mean, we could always do more, you know, from a young age, and I think just the way we teach engineering, you know, let's, let's, um, share the success stories where technologies have changed the world for the better, you know, and really get the smartest, you know, the, the, the smartest people and the most committed people, the hardest workers, to work on these problems that really matter for society. I think we could do more. We are, you know, many educators around the world are, are working hard at this, but, um, you know, just, just um, I don't know, just just continually kind of making this a priority in terms of the education, new educational programs we're developing and, you know, and, and um, finding uh, support for those sorts of educational programs. It's not just about AI, it's not just about, you know, data I, science, but I what do you do with those? I want to just um, step in though, because all of you yeah. are, are on the, you know, university level, you're teaching, and I, I just, one place that I, I feel like maybe we need more emphasis is on the, yeah. younger level, yeah. where kids are getting exposed to this stuff at a much younger age. Well, you, you hit a, you're hitting a great point here. I mean, you're hitting the base of the pyramid. And, and I always think, yeah, education is the absolute core. If I was, I, I sometimes ask people, and you could ask yourself this, if you were in a position where you're running the world, or you're running the US, you know, what would you do? What would be the first thing that you would do and when I asked myself this, I was like, I would, I would double down on education because an uneducated public is not a, um, a useful public that we want. So we need an educated public. Yeah, so, it just, it, I, and interdisciplinary, yeah. which is your next thing, is mixing culture. You know, we can't think silos. We've got to cross silos. We've got, as scientists, we've got to think, yeah, fashion's important, culture's important. Um, I want to work with musicians, with dancers, with anybody to get the message because we all learn differently. Um, there, I bet if we were going to do a survey, people walking into this room, we'd get like 80 different stories of what we thought about this panel. Um, and just we, we process so differently. Um, so we have to try to educate in many ways um, to get at this answer. I think if we want a generation of makers to come up, we need to rethink the way we use technology in, in education, though. Right now, we use so much control technology to spy on kids to make sure they're not looking at porn, to make sure they're not cyberbullying, to, to do whatever. And if you let them reconfigure their computers, then they defeat that. And so we have this message, you're not allowed to alter your computer. Well, if, you're, if you can't seize the means of computation, how will, we gener how will we have a generation that comes up and repurposes their computers? I, sadly, we are, we are running out of time here. We only have just a few seconds left. So does anybody have like a 10 second pithy remark? on this topic? <laughs> uh, when we were in Tibet, um, uh, uh, we show the machine. All the kids, their eyes just brights up, okay? And we collect the material, build the school, and then all of a sudden they're like, what can I do to do this? That's Th what they that, want that to know. That is the perfect place yeah. to end. That is so, so optimistic. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank all of you so much.